Welcome to Heart to Heart. I'm Lori Pearson from Mobile, Alabama, and I'm delighted to be here today with several of our Hardy's Facebook admins. Who's joining me today? Hi, <laughs> I'm Amy Caravello, and I am from Lancaster, Massachusetts. And I'm Christy Miller, and I'm from Hudsonville, Michigan. Jen Young from Seattle, Washington. And we are out in force today because we are privileged to welcome the Wind Calls the Heart co-creator and executive producer, Brian Bird, with us today, the man whose whole heart has been poured into the little show that could. Brian, welcome to Heart to Heart. Thank you, guys. I'm so thrilled to be with you tonight and uh, excited for this uh, brand new season of Wind Calls the Heart. Uh, that we all get to celebrate in this way. So thank you for inviting me. I've been uh, looking forward to this. Okay, we've been looking forward to it too. So I think we know the answer to this first question, but did you ever in your wildest dreams think we'd, we would be here for season nine? And frankly, with, as a hashtag says, all in for season 10. <laughs> exactly, exactly right. Uh, you know, I, I'm just, I, I just have to scratch my head most of the time when I think about what has come together uh, over the, this last decade. Um, this Hardy's community, you know, the show is one thing, and that has been a, an incredible blessing that we could have never have expected, uh, not in our wildest dreams, ever, ever, ever. When Michael and I first started working on this project way back in 2008 and nine. Um, to think that we would be more than a decade later now uh, since we started working on it, but you know, nine seasons into this little show that could, as you said, um, you know, it, it, it never in never in our biggest dream, our biggest fantasy. We honestly, Michael and I, when we first started and before we got to even meet all of you gals and you find hardy admins who are the you guys are the are the straw that stirs the drink in my opinion um <laughs> everybody says i'm the pot stirrer but i think you guys are actually the the people that keep the the meal on the table um you know back when it first started we we were just michael and i were just we we're just trying to make a show we we're just trying to do the best show we could and to create a characters that the audience would you know, hopefully fall in love with. Um, you know, we, we didn't think about the fact that nobody else was making a show like When Calls the Heart at the time and, and hadn't, honestly, for a long time. Uh, the, the previous show that, you know, the, the last TV show that I had really been deeply involved in prior to When Calls the Heart was Touch by an Angel. And we ended that Pro, that show after nine seasons of that show in 2003, right? So it had been several years since uh, I had really had a television show on the air. And so, you know, we had, Michael and I, I think we lost sort of lost perspective, a little bit of perspective of the fact that nobody else was making programming like this at the time. And you know, I, I've said it many times, you know, when you when you find an art, an island full of, of starving people and you bring soul food to them, you bring them nourishment, you know, for their souls, um, they respond. Mm -hmm. And and that's what happened. That, that's honestly what happened. And the Hardys were this amazing grassroots phenomenon that many of you were involved in right at the very beginning, you guys were sort of catalytic, honestly, for this fan grassroots fan movement. You know, we, we were just, I guess, just smart enough or not so dumb that we, that we, we didn't respond. And that, that honestly was, was the key to me is, is, you know, the Hardys began to speak to us on so on social media. And this was, you know, kind of in the early days, really, of of sort of the the big, you know, explosion of all the platforms and everything. But when we started to 
to see you talking to us on social media, we were just like, that's really cool. But like, what are we supposed to do? And so <laughs> back in the Touch by an Angel days, you know, there was there was email, you know, early days of email uh, and letter writing and phone calls and so forth. Mm -hmm. But there was no social media. So this was sort of a, a, a new thing that was happening. And the audience spoke back to us. The Hardys spoke to us. And, mm -hmm. you know, as a, as a programmer, you know, as somebody who creates content, that's your, that's your big dream, like that the audience will actually respond to you in, and hopefully in a good way, right? And so when the Hardys spoke to us, we were just smart enough to, to speak back and to talk back and encourage our cast to start talking back too. And I think that that, that marriage of, 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 you know, the Hardy's uh, hunger and our little bit of food that we would could put out there uh, just created this magical environment. Uh, and honestly, the, you know, why I saw on, on Facebook the other, you know, last week, I think, and I can't even remember who posted it, but it, it was a, a, a photo, uh, a still, you know, screen grab of When Calls a Heart in season one and hashtag Hardee's was on the screen because it mm -hmm. reminded me that, that Hallmark saw it too, right? The Hallmark mm -hmm. channel saw it too. And they said, we got to talk back to them. And by by invoking the Hardys on screen, I just think it was this incredible magic that that happened, and it just blew up. It just mm -hmm. blew up. So, anyway, no, we could not have ever imagined <laughs> this. And, and, oh, we, and honestly, we didn't either, but we hoped for it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and we're 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 blessed. We're grateful. We're humbled. I you know if I never did another stitch of movies or tv in my life this would be a pretty for me a, a, a very satisfying fulfilling sort of crowning achievement that we could Aww. get this show on the air and have a, a a group of of fans that that we love back as much as i think hopefully they love the show and and care about us too oh that's sweet but you're not allowed to stop doing anything yet no okay well <laughs> We won't. We, we won't. won't. <laughs> as long as y'all keep showing up, we will not stop. We're here. All right, Brian. Speaking of the Hardys talking to you and showing up, when we let them know that we were going to be talking to you, they flooded us with questions that they wanted us to ask you. That and we're going to get right down to it. And we've got a whole list. Uh, we're going to start off with Reggie Ma. And she's from Edmonton, Alberta. And she was wondering when writers start thinking about the next season, do they wait until there's an official renewal from Hallmark or is it sooner than that? Great question, Reggie. Thank you for your question. And it's an honor to be able to, to answer you in this way. And I hope, I hope you're, watch, you're watching right now because we, we, uh, we love this ability to interact with, with anybody and everybody who, who loves the show and wants to talk to us. Um, yeah, it's a great question. You know, we're always uh, in the, in the early days of one calls the heart, you know, we had no idea if the show would ever continue past, you know, from season to season. And I think it was not really until probably season four that we really started to feel more comfortable with the idea of, okay, well, we got something really good here and the network, you know, to, would be crazy to cancel this. That, I mean, you know, in our, in our opinion, because we saw this incredible Hardy's community, you know, showing up for the show. And, and we also, you know, saw the, the ratings were growing right each, each year. Um, and so we, you know, we started to, to feel a little more confident that, okay, well, maybe, Maybe this is going to be sort of a done deal quickly, right? And, you know, in some years, I'll be honest, we know earlier than you guys do. <laughs> um, we just can't say anything uh, because the, you know, the, the, net, the network has very special plans about how they like to 
you know, announce mm -hmm. that big surprise and that great news to the to the Hardy's community. And so we have to sort of, you know, stifle, stifle it for ourselves. And, and even though we're sort of mm -hmm. chomping at the bit to be able to share the good news, we can't. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes we know even, you know, months ahead of when this news will, will come out. And we have to play it very close to the vest. So when that's the case, Reggie, yes, we do begin the creative process early uh, because we want to get a jump on on the next season. And, you know, it takes um, the writer's room is about a 10 week process to get, uh, you know, most of the stories figured out. And then a handful of the writers stick around for longer, obviously, throughout production to sort of shepherd the process. And so, but that initial writer's room is about a 10 week process. So that's two and a half months. So you can see that if we, if we start, you know, shooting, we start production in July, like we have the last few years, um, in order to get that great weather up in Vancouver on our side, um, you know, just back backdate that and Usually, if you do the math, it comes before the end of the season and before the network has announced. And sometimes the network, um, you know, I think pretty much every year, I mean, it's a bit of a blur to me after nine years, but I think almost every year they like to wait till the very end of the season to keep to keep everybody sort of on edge and excited and embracing, you know, for the big news. And oh, come on, they just want to torture us. It's, it's, it's torture. And it's torture for us not to be able to say anything. It works. Right? Because we because we 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 want desperately for the Hardys to get, you know, to get all these prizes and presents and gifts to them. And and sometimes that doesn't always work, you know, hand in hand with the marketing. But you know, the big the writers begin working on sort of the big uh, what we call arcs of the season the big character arcs of the season you know mm -hmm. what is henry going to go through what is elizabeth going to go through what is you know uh elizabeth and now lucas going to go through in the last few years what were lucas and 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 nathan and elizabeth going to go through right so the these big arcs right are sort of the first thing that we talk about and then specific smaller storylines start to to come together uh, at once we sort of figure out, you know, um, how we want to end a season and we don't ever want to end the season with too much of a resolution because, well, we want the Hardys to be, you know, on the edge of their seats and, and those collective gasps that we have heard across, you know, North America at the end of, of a season we want to continue those. Those are really cool. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> the, so we, we do sort of, we sort of know what the, what the end is early. You know, we know mm -hmm. where the, where the big, you know, the big arcs are going. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I've often said, um, unless you, as you're, as you're working on the process, unless you keep the ending in mind, you will end up with a mindless ending. And we don't want any mindless endings. We want to keep the end in mind so that we're building toward that big finale and toward that big event. And uh, so anyway, I hope, I hope Reggie, that answers that question uh, for you. So speaking of the production process, with being nine seasons so far, how has that production process changed over the years, obviously COVID changed a lot, but um, how has just kind of the production process overall changed throughout these last nine seasons? You know, it, it's uh, it's a Chinese fire drill when you first start, and I hope that's <laughs> not any sort of a pejorative uh, term that I'm using there. But it's it's sort of it's it's controlled chaos when you're first starting uh, a pros a project like this, and because you're you're, you're, we were discovering the show too. We were discovering the characters that those first few years, figuring out 
what the show should be, you know, how it should, uh, you know, how, how to bring the Hardys back each week. Uh, how much resolve do we give them in each episode? You know, those are sort of the creative parts of the production process that we have to figure out. Um, but once you, once a show finds itself, and I, and to be honest with you, I don't think we really found sort of the magic, you know, sweet spot of One Calls a Heart till about season three. I, I, I really don't. And, and, you know, I, I don't know if you have watched other long running shows, but when you go back and look at the earlier seasons, you realize that they, you know, the writers and the, the actors and everybody, they were still figuring out the show at that point, right? And, and sometimes it looks uneven. You don't, you know, it doesn't resemble what the show ha becomes later when it matures and so forth. Um, you know, a, in, when we got to season three and we sort of with the network all decided that it was that we needed to instead of sort of Downton Abbey light which I think you would all agree that's what season two kind of became um we we felt like we missed the magic of of you know at the time Coal Valley and then Hope Valley you know the the small town life was really important and I think that's what people sort of first became fascinated with. And yes, the beautiful costumes and the, 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 the big sets and all of that, you know, those are fun and those are, those are grand and all of that. But we really, I think, discovered after season two that really the, the gold is back in, in Hope Valley. And it's been there ever since, right? Doesn't mean we don't travel outside of Hope Valley and take the storytelling to different towns and so forth but the gold is really there it's the community it's the community that that hardys want to move to themselves we hear often from them you know it's a it's that's a very meaningful thing to hear so in terms of the production process it's it's really it's you know the the technical side is what it is you know everybody you know everybody who works the cameras and the lights and and all the equipment and so forth, you know, that's going to happen no matter what. And and they're good at what they do. Uh, but finding the the flow of and the the feeling and the heartbeat of the show and of the community, I think, was is something that takes a little time and takes some patience on the part of the viewers to sort of stick with you and and to come back, want to come back for more and. The fact that the Hardys did, we're, we're just blessed by. I think sometimes they've had reason not to, as we've all discovered in the last few years. But um, they've stuck with us through thick and thin uh, for the most part. And, and uh, we couldn't be more grateful, you know, for the loyalty and the passion. Uh, and now it's a finely tuned machine so from a production standpoint uh it's a finely tuned machine covid didn't even beat us we made it through two years with with the covid protocols and there were only a few small scares and our t our crew and our cast they were so valiant making it through that time and we're sort of excited if there is a season 10 that that we'll have a little more freedom again uh on set and we won't be so you know limited or restricted by those rules well we're definitely hoping for season 10 yes me too uh leah hardwick of saint charles missouri wants to know if you could be any character in hope valley who would you be <laughs> oh man i love that question so much um we do too <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's hard for me, uh, and I've said this other, you know, I've had other people say, well, what's your favorite movie that you've worked on, or what's, what's your favorite, you know, show you've written for, and so forth, and, and it's, and, and this may, you know, be a sort of cliche thing, but they're all, they all feel like my children, and I all, I love them all for different reasons, right, I, 
I, I don't, I can't play favorites, you know, because they're my kids, they're my creative kids. And I, I have pride in them uh, and, and how they've, you know, grown up and come to life themselves and, and now have their own, a life of their own, right? And When Calls a Heart is absolutely, you know, without a doubt has a life of its own. Um, so, you know, fr from the standpoint of the characters, um, this is gonna sound really crazy, but I love Mike Hickam <laughs> because he's, because Mike Hickam, you know, everybody's going to say, oh, don't you want to be the Mountie in the hat and the red serge jacket? And, or don't, you know, don't you want to be somebody, you know, like fights crime and all that? I love the underdogs. I've always been about underdogs in life. And um, Ben Rosenbaum is a fantastic actor and, and you don't get to see you don't get to see all the colors that that man brings to the to the table, but I love I love Hickam. I I created Hickam personally. It was oh. my creation, and and his name was my creation. And um, at first we just called him Hickam, and that's what Bill calls him too, mm -hmm. just Hickam. Mm -hmm. You know, but and then but then we finally found his his first name in later years. <laughs> uh, but I just thought, what a cool opportunity for a guy that you don't expect much from when you first see him. But underneath, there's he's a he's a man of of many of many colors and flavors, and and uh, and so I I I I've always thought of myself as sort of a Hickam in the world. Uh, I I was never the best student in the world in in school. Uh, I, I was always sort of just a B student in the school of life, um, but I just had this deep desire to work hard and to and to to be to be better than than my station in life. And I think that's really fun to see Mike Mike Hickam finally flowering in a lot of ways and trying to find his way, bumble his way through, you know, now being the mayor of Hope Valley. <laughs> Well, we will never see my kickum the same again because we'll always think of that. Uh, <laughs> that is so cool. I love it. <laughs> um, going back to the writing process, Camille Eide, who is one of our uh, founding admins of the group yes. from Eugene, Oregon, wonders how many, with so many seasons and storylines, how do you decide which threads to carry through? Great question from Camille, and and I love Camille, and and as as a creative herself and a wonderful author herself, uh, I I appreciate that question very much. We've been in in writing conferences together, teaching and and sharing time together, and so I I love her work, and I've read her her books, and have been a big fan. Um, all I can say is that. You know, when you have a team of six or seven writers around this project, it's one of the funnest processes in the world. Being in that writing room, uh, it's not very glamorous. It's a lot of long hours. Um, now with COVID, it's been all on Zoom, which is a grind, you know, because you don't get to, you don't get to kibitz, you don't get to have as much personal time with them with everybody but there's and i've done it now i've been in a writing room for you know over 300 episodes of tv in my career uh, all these decades and it's it's really cool it's really cool it's a nerdy thing not everybody would like it but it's 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 like a mid-eastern camel market sometimes because people are sort of yelling at each other and, and, and pitching ideas. And, uh, and, and the goal is always to make it better, right? And everybody who's there, uh, whatever sense of competition there is, you know, some writing rooms can be, can be like shark tank, shark, uh, like shark mm -hmm. stomachs, actually, where all the little sharks are eat, trying to eat each other to be the lone survivor. Mm -hmm. And, wow. um, Sometimes they can be like that, but we don't run it that way. Uh, our, we run it as a family where iron sharpens iron uh, because we want, 
we want the product to be the best it can be and the most interesting and the most unpredictable it can be. You know, we don't want to just give people what, you know, if you could predict everything that happens on the show, we'd be doing a bad job. Right. And I, and I've had to say that often when people haven't been that happy with how it's gone. Um, I've had to say, you know, if we were predictable, you would hate the show. And I know this to be true because I've been on shows like that before and people lose interest. We all, you know, we're all part of the collective, right? Because we're all part, we're all part of the entire, uh, mm -hmm. the world of Hope Valley, the, the, the universe mm -hmm. that has, the metaverse that has been created around, you know, this community. We're all part of that too. We all feel like we're members of that community. So we're all, you know, attuned to, you know, what happens on the show. And in the last several seasons, I've not been in the writing room. I've only been dive bombing it, reading scripts and talking to John Tinker or Alfonso Moreno, you know, giving ideas. Um, we, you know, we, we've kind of become the proud grandparents of this process, which is kind of fun to check in on the kids <laughs> now from time to time. Uh, so the, but, but the, but everybody invests equally in the process. So, and there is a writer's assistant, a script coordinator in the room who has to keep it all in their minds. They're taking furious notes of everything that's said around that table. Is that and, Allie Devereaux? John has mentioned that name. Yes. Is that, yes. Know, he's Allie, talking about her very fondly. Allie's great. The last two seasons, she, she's been fantastic for the team. And, and, you know, she has to keep it all in her head and on, on her keyboard, right? Because she's taking notes of everything. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and the, the beautiful, beautiful part, even though we've had showrunners, you know, we've had four now since Michael and I were running the show, the first few seasons, the, the, um, the showrunners have been new to the process and have had to just drink from a fire hose to understand what the show is. But a lot of the other writers have been consistently there for, for many seasons now. So they know all the history, right, of Hope Valley. They know all the history and all the storylines. And, you know, the goal is to try not to do repeats if we can possibly do that. Mm -hmm. So... Anyway, that's a long-winded answer, Camille, but I hope, I hope that gives you a little bit of a sense of, of how the process works. That's good. You gave us a little peek into the process. I like that. Well, Brian, we cannot thank you enough for all the time that you devote to the Hardys. You are so generous with your time with all of us. My, one of my favorite things to do in the world. Thank you guys for inviting me to be part of this. And um, it's a really cool show that you're putting on for for all the Hardys. And, and uh, I, as soon as I know when it's coming, man, I will point everybody I know to, to go watch. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Hardys, for tuning in to Heart to Heart. See you Sunday night at eight o'clock on Hallmark Channel. And come tweet with us. Big Hardys Twitter party every Sunday night using hashtag Hardys. Bye. Thank you. Love you all.